Hi, Tricia. Thanks so much for joining me, friend. Um, I've been really looking forward to this. I have wanted to have you on for quite some time, and my schedule does not always allow me to do podcast recordings, and you were right up there in the queue, so I'm so glad we could find some time. And um, I think in general, um, reflecting on why I wanted to talk to you, there's like two sides of it. One is I'm just very curious about your work and Reiki and the support that you give people. You know, I've done sessions with you myself, found them very powerful and just excited to hear more about that work that you do. And then also, I, you know, I mentioned this today on Twitter, uh, unfortunately misspelling your handle since I put it in my notes app, but um, you just strike me as a really sweet person like incredibly sweet. And uh, I love that. Like it makes me happy to see you on the timeline or to talk to you. And so uh, I feel like I'm always interested in people's work or projects on the show, but also people's character and what their life is like. And that feels like a quality that comes through really strongly uh, when I see you write or when I talk to you. And so just uh, in some ways, I see this as a chance to dive deeply into one person and who they are and what it's like to be them and really witness them to the best of my ability. And that's also why I like to ask this difficult, I know, life story question, because for me, the facts and stories people have about their own life and what they've been through is really inseparable from understanding someone on their own terms. Like, how do they see themselves and what have they been through and why did they make the choices that they've made? And so often the specific questions that I want to ask someone are really inseparable from and given nuance by learning about like, oh, this is where they grew up or what challenges they went through or this is what was um, th what they were hoping for or something like that. And so I just love to zoom out and see what it's like to be someone and hear them talk about their life. So um, yeah, with that, I'd love to hear from you what your life story has been. What has happened so far in your life? Anything you would like to share in whatever length or whatever way you'd like? You know, it's funny because sometimes I get in like these spaces where I'm like, I've done nothing. I've done nothing in my life. And every time that happens, I make myself sit down and I have a document now when like write out all of the things that I've done. And it's so much. So I've done a lot. I've got a story to tell you. Um. I was born on the East Coast, and I have a Southern father and a Northern mother, which made for a really interesting culture growing up in our home, because they think very differently, um, but they love each other a lot. And we moved to the Midwest when I was really young. So most of my childhood through my early 20s was in Ohio, I grew up in a field pretty much and spent a whole lot of time just running around talking to trees, which I still do. But um, we we had like three acres on some farmland and my brothers and I just like played outside all the time and made up all these like crazy imaginative stories. And one of my favorite memories from childhood is that I taught myself to climb my favorite tree with my eyes closed in case I ever went blind. I'm not really sure when I was so afraid that I would go blind, but you know, I was, I was prepared in case it happened. Like the thing that was important to me was that I could still climb that tree. Um, and I was homeschooled and my parents were still are pretty conservative Christians. So I grew up very much in that culture. And then I read a lot. I wrote a lot. I baked a ton. I still do all of those things. <laughs> those things haven't changed about me one bit. Um, and then my parents moved when I was in college. So instead of being the kid that went away to college, my whole family left me. And that sort of started off a really interesting and formative period of my life um yeah they moved across the country and I didn't go because I didn't want to when I was in college and I just didn't really 
feel like leaving, I guess, with them. Like I was already kind of doing my own thing. So I, I stayed behind in Ohio for a little while. I had an internship in PR that I did for a year. I was dating someone that I almost married that I've written about and I didn't marry him because I didn't like him, which is a good reason to not marry somebody. I wish I'd figured that one out a little bit sooner for his sake. But, um, and then I moved to Idaho um, shortly after that. It was like a lot cheaper to go to school there. And um, they had a really good program for what I was studying. And then, so I moved across the country and then I moved to Mexico because my degree required that I like study abroad for a semester. So I moved to Mexico, started talking to my husband who is from Michigan, like literally grew up like two hours from where I did. Um, and then I went back to Idaho for a little bit. And then after I graduated, I moved back to Michigan and we got married. Then we traveled the country in an RV for a couple of years. And then we got tired of that and settled in Austin. I had my son. And that set off another really formative period of my life. My um my son's birth was really traumatic. We both we both almost died. And he was in the NICU for a month. And the first year and a half of his life was pretty much the most traumatic period of my life I think like just straight he never slept he always cried it was just I ended up getting PTSD from him crying so much like it was just it was rough and during that space of time my body crashed because of I just didn't really have the tools to handle it what was going on didn't know how to handle stress very well and it was just too much stress for too long and my body crashed. And then that was a good thing because after that point, I started looking for how to heal my body. And I knew, I knew a lot because my dad actually has, I have chronic fatigue, which my dad has too. So it wasn't like unfamiliar territory, but I felt like, I felt like something was missing. Like I was missing just a piece. And it wasn't really connected to my my intuition at the time. Like it was very quiet and disconnected. But for some reason, I kept thinking, oh, energy work. Like I need, it has to be energy work. Like that's the thing I'm missing, which is hilarious because I have no, I had no framework for that. Like I didn't know what that meant. I had never done that. I'd never experienced it at all. So I, I, um, I like asked my most woo friend at the time where she would start if she wanted to do energy work and she's like oh reiki you should you should check that out and i was like okay cool and signed up to get trained and i still don't know why other than i think i think i was just listening and didn't realize i was doing that at the time because like a normal person a normal person Tashin, would have just found a practitioner, gotten a session and been like, oh yes, I feel better now. That was good for my body. But no, me, I'm like, yes, let's go get trained. That's that's the way to do it. Um, and I'm so glad that I did because clearly that has now been my life path since that point. And that was like four and a half years ago. Um, and that first, that first training session, I had a vision that made it very clear that Reiki was going to be my life path. And at the time I was just like, yeah, no, that's nice. Don't think so. <laughs> Try next time, please. Because in my head, I was just like, I need this for my body. I need it for my son and my husband and it's for us. And I just hadn't, I just, I wasn't, I also wasn't ready for it to even be something that I considered sharing with other people or doing as a job. Like that took years for me to be ready to do that and a lot of work and I got mentored and trained for two years before I was like okay all right I could do this with other people that would be okay <laughs> and then it took another two years two and a half years for me to be like oh yes I'm supposed to be teaching I'm the one who's supposed to be doing this 
and um and that's where I am now teaching I started teaching this year and I had another little boy in there in the middle so now I have two sons that I homeschool on top of having a business and a family and um yeah that's that's me now thank you so much for sharing all of that um I don't even quite know why, but again, I, maybe it's just in being in your company, but it makes me smile and feel happy uh, to hear about all of this. Um, I have a few questions coming up from what you shared. First one is, when you look back, as you just did, how do you see yourself having changed? Like, how has your character developed over time? Mm -hmm. I used to be really I don't, in some ways I'm the same like I am still someone who cares a lot about people and I think I've always been that's not true I used to be really angsty and really anxious and really unhappy and underneath that I know I cared about other people I've always had this like deep desire to serve and love and help um but I wasn't very grounded and I wasn't confident or sure of myself and my ability to do that and I was also very young so I didn't I don't know there's I just I think there was a lot that got in the way of me doing that and I've gone through some really challenging experiences since then <laughs> um again and again and again and I have chosen I have made the conscious decision in each one of those hard things. Not immediately. It's taken me some time. Not the fastest processor in the world. But every single time that these hard things have happened to me, I've decided that I was going to make meaning from it. Whether or not the thing itself actually had meaning, I was going to give it meaning and I was going to grow and I was going to use that to become the person I wanted to be step by step. Um, and I've, I've continued that trajectory my entire life. Like I do not, um, don't really seem to mind being really uncomfortable and choosing to be uncomfortable to get where I want to be or to grow. And I've looking back, I can see that developing over the last couple of decades. Hmm. makes me want to ask one of my favorite questions to ask, which is, how do you see what the universe is and what it means to be alive in it? I don't even know if I have a good answer for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I... I think I see everything and nothing in the universe. Like, I think I see that Reiki has given me the ability to see how connected everything is. Like, I fundamentally believe absolutely everything is connected on every level possible. And as small as we are, that still means we all have a really important part to play. And I think that's like, that's kind of just how I approach life and the universe hmm. it's a good answer you had one <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what the universe means i still don't know it's well there. i'm still I learning how to ask this question but <laughs> to me this kind of question is less of a like there is a right answer to this math problem kind of question and more of how do you relate to this thing question um, because i'm interested in trisha not I mean, I am interested in the universe, but for this <laughs> time of our conversation, I'm most interested in Trisha as such. And we all have to relate to the universe and to our lives and come to some kind of sense of what it is, even if it's there is no sense. You know, that is a kind of sense in itself. Um, so I love what you shared and you're gracious to humor me with my question. Um, I'm going to ask a different kind of hard question now, <laughs> uh, which is you know, I am a man in a male body. And at least in this lifetime, I believe in reincarnation, I will never give birth to someone. And 
you've done that twice and have two sons. And I wonder what you could tell me as a man about what that's like to be pregnant and to give birth to a child. Like, what would you want someone to know about what that's like? Either a man who's never going to experience that or a woman who hasn't. What is that like? That's a complicated question for me to answer because mm -hmm. I am not, um, I haven't really had typical experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I've had really hard pregnancies that have been pretty traumatic. I've been very sick both times, um, like throwing up the entire time. Um, and I've gained 60 pounds with each pregnancy and I'm tiny, I'm tiny. So that's a lot of weight on, on me. Um, it was hard. It was really hard. And at the same time, as with a lot of life, the really hard has a whole lot of good in it too. Um, it's, I'm not going to say I really think pregnancy is magical and amazing because I really didn't experience it that way. But also knowing that those tiny little people have heard my heartbeat from the inside is mind blowing to me. No one else is going to hear my heartbeat from the inside, but they have. And they are like, their cells are in my body. That's amazing. Um, it's just, it's weird. Being pregnant is weird. Having kids is bizarre. Like that feels like that shouldn't happen that way, but it, it does. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good answer for this one either. It's so strange. And I didn't have, sometimes I struggle with thinking I missed out on something because I didn't have easy pregnancies and I didn't really like it. Um, and that's not true. That's just not true. This was my experience. It's just the way it played out and that's okay. Um, and I think that's the important thing to remember about pregnancy and having children is that it's really just different with every pregnancy, with every child, because they were both very different. Both of my boys are really different people. They felt very different inside. They feel on the outside the way they did on the inside. My oldest son um, is like pure light. He is just, he's always moving. He is never still. He's very bright. He felt that way before I had him. And my youngest son, I had to stop practicing Reiki when I was pregnant with him because he was just like communicated to me I don't like other people in my space and he's still that way he just he likes the people he likes and he would prefer the other people just keep a distance mm -hmm. um and that's okay and knowing that about them before they were ever out here is also kind of amazing mm -hmm. wow wow I love that answer and I'm Grateful again that you humored me. Uh, mm. I think you said a little bit about this, but what were you on track to do if you had never encountered Reiki? Oh, well, I've done a lot of different, <laughs> I've had a lot of different careers actually. But um, before I had my kids, I was in digital marketing, which I hated because. I don't like talking about things I'm not interested in. And I really don't like selling things I'm not interested in. So that wasn't ever going to work out. And I had in between that and Reiki, I was working as a personal stylist, which I loved. And I still do sometimes on the side because that's just creative and fun and really empowering because clothes are not at all about clothes. They are about everything. And um, yeah. That kind of fed my creativity while also letting me love other people. And um, I liked doing that. So I don't know. I don't know what else I would have done if I hadn't have found Reiki. Hmm. Who knows? I may do other things. I have other plans. I'd like to write a book someday. I'd like to spend like two years gardening. Like I'm thinking after my boys leave, I'm just going to like grow a garden for a few years. That sounds like fun to me. I don't know. I'm going to do other things too. Hmm. What do you hope the book might be about? Do you have a sense or just want to write a book? 
No, I like my writing style has been pretty consistent my whole life. I really just like writing about the things I'm thinking about and my stories and my experiences and how all of those things fit together with the world I'm living in. Hmm. So I sort of imagine I'll just be a book of sketches or hmm. essays or the things I like to write. Hmm. How would you characterize your writing? Hmm. Well, I've... <laughs> I took a long time off from writing. Um, I didn't write after I had my boys for a while. It just wasn't, you know, sometimes in life, even the things that we we really love just come and go in seasons. And writing does feel like very much like a part of who I am. And I need it to feel alive. But I just didn't, there was just so much other so many other things going on and I just didn't have the space for it. And I didn't feel like I had words. Like I didn't feel like I could say anything for a little while. And then I picked it back up about a year ago and just started writing my stories, like all the things that I've done, all of the things I've learned from them. Um, I don't know. I probably, I probably write with too many words <laughs> too many descriptions <laughs> and um I don't know I just I like writing about about life and I don't know what kind of style is that <laughs> it's just me <laughs> uh -huh. what makes you really pleased with a piece if you finish it and you're like I really like this I'm proud of this one mm. I really like connecting things to stories because I think when I first started writing again I was just writing like my thoughts and it felt really flat to me because I wasn't connecting them to the stories that made those thoughts come alive and so I'm really proud when I find and I remember a good story from my life that really connects with the thing I want to say um that makes it feel really alive to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming back to what you said about your career and different things that you've done, I'm curious, how have the different jobs that you've worked or experiences you've had affected the way in which you show up to your current work sharing Reiki with the world? Um, hmm. I think with everything I've done, all of my jobs I've I mean I've learned from all of them and all of those things are still with me so of course they come out when I'm doing now um a job I had before I got married was I worked I worked at a strip mine in Idaho out we had to be there at like five o'clock in the morning and it was really cold at five o'clock in the morning and they it was a strip mine. So they're like testing, looking for soil samples and like looking for specific things. And that's also was basically making mud pies for an entire summer. Like it was filthy. And it's the most satisfied I've ever been. Like that job taught me that being physically tired has a whole lot of value and that I can do a lot of things. I mean, I was this girl from like Ohio, like I've never built a fence I and I learned that I could and that job taught me that I could do a whole lot more than I thought I could and it would stand a whole lot more than I thought I could and the marketing job really taught me that I kind of need to be doing something I love doing like I need to be doing something that I'm passionate about <laughs> I just am not very good at it like, I, I think I'm fine at marketing, but not if I don't care about what I'm talking about. Like, that comes through. And the styling kind of pointed me towards wanting to do something that makes people feel really good about who they are and shows them the best parts of themselves so that they can take that with them into the world. And, I mean, that's kind of what I do with Reiki a little bit it's it's a piece of it so I feel like all of these things are still they're still there they still come out what I'm doing now 
I feel that really strongly in my own life and really with everyone seeing how the experiences that they've been through inform how they show up there. And yeah, maybe I was interested in particular because um, on the one hand, feeling like these experiences prepare us for what we're going through and also on paper, it's like, wow, that was a big change. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an especially interesting context to ask that question of like, you know, I don't know if you'd gone on to like make a startup or something, or I don't know, like run your own marketing company or something. I, I wouldn't ask you like, how did your previous experiences inform you? Uh, <laughs> but given that it's like on paper, a very different thing, uh, but also knowing that these things inform, that's part of why I wanted to ask, I think so. Uh, um, so how to ask this question, you talked a little bit about knowing that you wanted something more or something was missing and then, then you do Reiki, <laughs> you, you know, you asked your friend, she said, Reiki, uh, you signed up, you did the training and you said, uh, something, I forget exactly how you worded this, but like, um, I would translate it as you were trusting yourself on an intuitive level in a way that maybe you didn't know at the time you were doing. But um, I guess that's what I want to ask you is to, can you say a little bit more about that, how you understand this process of trusting your intuition, how you would describe that or relate to it in your own experience? Mm. I think that I have always been a highly intuitive person growing up out in the middle of nowhere and being homeschooled gifted that to me. Like mm. I grew I grew up in silence. I grew up outside. There was I had nothing to do but listen to myself. So I knew how to do that as a child. Maybe not in those words and I certainly wasn't raised with that framework. Um, Can you say more yeah. about that? It that makes a lot of sense to me from my own experiences but what, what, imagine someone that doesn't make sense to them. What does that mean? <laughs> like why would silence and being with yourself cause you to cultivate intuition? Because when there's nothing else to hear, when there's nothing else to distract you, the thing you're left with is yourself, with that voice. And I grew up just kind of hearing my own thoughts and listening to my own body and listening to like nature. Like I, I think this is a key piece. Like I grew up running around barefoot and talking to trees and climbing and spending hours and hours and hours outside. And there's this rhythm that the earth has that I think our intuition has too. Like I think they're, I don't have this perfectly mapped out, but to me, they feel very similar. Like when I drop into my feet and kind of listen to the way the earth buzzes, my intuition feels a little bit similar, like the, I don't know, like the way the wind moves through the trees sort of feels like my intuition moving through my body or that probably does not make any sense. Oh, it makes perfect of, sense. You're doing great. <laughs> they kind of feel the same to me. And I just grew up listening to those things because that's what I had in my environment. And um, so I've just kind of always listened to the physical world around me and listened to my own body, but I lost that growing up. I did. Um, my parents, this is not true of them now, and I respect them for this so much, but they grew up stomping every emotion out of me that they could. Mm -hmm. They just, not through any fault of their own at all. They just, they did not grow up knowing how to do that. So they did not do that for me. That is not true of them anymore. They are totally different people now. They have done a lot of that work. And that's been amazing to and healing to watch as an adult. Um, but I didn't really have that growing up. And over through those teenage years of like getting my heart broken and deciding I didn't want to feel things anymore, like I turned it off for a while because it felt like and maybe that's just a natural process like to be the the girl who has a lot of intuition and feels too much and then something big happens and it's too much so you just mm. turn it off for a while because you didn't know what else to do with it um so I did 
for several years, just kind of, and those years are fuzzy. Even in my memory, I have been going back recently and conjuring those memories again, but those years even feel fuzzy to me that I wasn't, wasn't really in my body or I wasn't really connected to my own inner voice or intuition, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and then when we got in the RV and we were out in nature a lot again, I heard it whispering. And we spent so much time outside and just listening and being quiet. And I was like, oh, I remember this. But I wasn't there yet. I wasn't quite there yet. And then all the trauma with my son happened. And, and it still comes through. And I think that is like such an important thing that even if, even if we're at a point in our life, where we don't feel like we're connected to that or you don't have that framework anymore or it's been dismantled, it could still come through because I still heard it. I still, for some reason, went and signed up for training instead of getting a session. And that changed the trajectory of my life. Like, here I am now, almost five years later, with my own practice teaching other people. When five years ago, I didn't have that. I didn't have, I wasn't connected to my intuition. I didn't feel that thing I feel in my body now when I know I'm supposed to do something or not do something that feels so easy to me now. I don't even have words for it. That wasn't me five years ago. It might've been me as a child, but it wasn't me for a really long time. <laughs> and I've totally forgot what your original question was. I think I might've answered it but remind me what I'm supposed to be saying. <laughs> You're doing great, Trisha. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I want to actually return to the question, but from a new angle, okay. which is, um, you know, we're talking on Zoom and it's nice because there's two of us, but just imagine for a moment that there was a third panel here and there was a, another person who's a woman, which is yourself five years ago. And she's like, huh, this is weird. You look a lot like me. Uh, uh, and she's at the exact juncture of her life where she's considering signing up for this training. What would you tell her? Hmm. I think being in that space I would tell her the same thing I tell people now. It's just listen. Listen to what's there. What do you notice? Like, where's the, where's the pull? Where's the push away? Like, where's the, what's the first step that you think you could take that feels like you should follow? And that is what I did. And before that, there's one other story, one other decision I made that I think led to that. And my, when I first got sick, which was just a couple of months, like a couple of months before I signed up for Reiki, I decided, I realized, I had the realization that I was very unhappy, that whatever I was doing wasn't working. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do with that. That, that. That's like a big realization to be like, oh, I hate this. This is bad. I need to change this. How do you change your whole life? <laughs> um, so I changed the first thing that I could change that I knew needed to go. And I quit drinking completely. Not that I was an alcoholic, but I was absolutely using alcohol to numb. And I knew if I was numb, I knew if I was numb, I couldn't face anything at all. So I just stopped and Tasha, it took me four months, four months to not think about drinking every single day, four months of intense discomfort because I had nowhere to go from the really uncomfortable things I was feeling, being unhappy, knowing that I was probably in fight or flight most of the time that I was just miserable. 
And there was nowhere to go when I quit drinking, which is why I decided to stop drinking because I wanted to see what would happen if I got really uncomfortable again and what I would do or what I would notice if I just kind of felt it all. And I made that choice to just sit with being really uncomfortable for as long as it took for it to feel comfortable. And then I sort of trusted I would know what to do. And in that, out of that came, oh, let's, let's, let's go learn Reiki. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. It's one of those moments. Downloads. <laughs> um, I'm just going to feel that in my body for a second. Mm. Uh. Mm. Thank you. Mm. So what did your training involve? Um, Reiki training is really simple. You go, you get attuned. They talk for a few hours and you're done. Mm. Um, that's not really how you learn Reiki. Um, that's why I'm teaching now. Um, <laughs> There's a lot in that sentence. <laughs> Um, but I did, I, it, it was over a weekend. I did, um, Reiki has four levels. There are four levels to it. Kind of like, um, like, I don't know. I've heard it described as like bright, brighter, brighter, like bright, brighter, brightest. And then there's like the teaching level. Um, so it's just, it's all Reiki. It just gets a little bit stronger with each level. Like what you're able to channel is just a little more, a little stronger. Um, yeah, you just kind of go, they teach you the hand positions, they, you get attuned and you're sent on your way. Um, had that been my only experience, I do not think I would be here. I also that weekend had a really interesting energetic experience with the TA of that class. And so weird and so outside of like what I knew as to be normal that even then I was just like, I don't know what happened. Can you tell me what just happened? Because that's never happened to me before. Um, and he, I think he saw uh, what I could be. He saw what had happened somehow having more framework than I did and asked to mentor me. And I worked with him for almost two years of practicing and talking and doing all of the inner work that I needed to do to actually practice. Um, and I, without without him, without his guidance, I don't I don't know that I ever would have gotten to the place where I wanted to even have a practice. <laughs> Um, he gave me, he gave me space to work it out on my own and not be alone in doing that. Hmm. And that is really, really valuable. Can you say a little more about what happened in that moment? Um, <laughs> he, we were doing like a, like when I, the, like the energetic exchange between the two of us, I was practicing on another person. And he was standing beside me doing the same thing. And I felt the energy come out of his body and hit me. And so strongly that I almost fell over. And I was just like, I don't, we didn't talk about that in the class. Like, I don't think that was supposed to happen. <laughs> like, what, what was that? Um, and I think it was just the, he was supposed to be my teacher. Mm. It was just to take notice. This, this is, this is, this is what's happening. Hmm. Hmm. Can you say what attunement means? 
Um, it is so Reiki itself is just concentrated universal life force energy and it's passed through a lineage from teacher to student and the attunement process is just giving the person the ability to channel that frequency of energy Hmm. Hmm. and what did that process of working with your mentor look like a lot of doing sessions back and forth on one another um like him doing sessions on me and then me practicing on him talking about the things that came up in those sessions um honing in on the things that I would see or not know how to explain or not understand he would always point me back to just listening, listening to the body and listening to what's there. And that is, I mean, you've done Reiki with me. It's very much how I practice now. Um, and we would meditate, we would go on walks, we would just talk a lot about the things. Reiki kind of getting attuned kind of unraveled me. Um, it really seems to be a modality that, at least in my experience, expands your ability to notice and up your awareness. And when that happened, I just started seeing, oh, there's a pattern. I have this pattern. Do I want that pattern? Is that how I want to be conducting myself in this world? Is that the person I want to be? And a lot of us working together was me working through some of those things. And and having someone who is a little bit further along the path than me to just kind of point me back to myself hmm. and help me figure it out. Hmm. How would you characterize him as a mentor? Very confusing. Frustrating. Hmm. <laughs> um which is probably how I am too. Hmm. He he um wouldn't give me the answers, which I also don't do. Mm-hmm. Um, he would ask me another question or he would point me back to something else or say nothing at all. And he really taught me to go after things myself instead of being like and I know I know he saw every single one of those patterns I know he saw all of the things I was getting stuck on that I had never even vocalized and he never pointed them out once he let me find them and then come ask about them um which I think is one of the most valuable things a mentor can do is to not interrupt someone else's timeline Hmm. and he did not do that to me he let me have my time and my space um which allowed me to figure out how to do it myself can you say more about what that oh please no which which i think is what i needed because i would have just let him answer all of my questions and tell me what to do and gone and done that and nothing would have changed Hmm. (laughs) Um, and instead I got to go very slowly and very painfully and actually change some of the things I wanted to change. Hmm. Um, can you say more about what that means to you that you value a mentor not interrupting their student's timeline? I think there's a really... fine line between being with someone while they learn how to do it, while they grow to a place where they can see the things that they want to be seeing and pushing someone to get there. And from my own experience, the being pushed, the being rushed, 
doesn't quite drive the lesson home in the same way as you finding it out on your own and then making a very conscious choice about what to do with that thing. And I think the people who are really good at mentoring let people unfold on their own timeline as it's meant to without pushing them along the way or interrupting what they're doing. And and that takes a lot of patience because you kind of, you just, you kind of have to wait and let them come to you and let them decide what direction they want to go, even if you think it should be a different direction because it's their life and not mine. Mm. Mm. And just really sitting with that, I think that the words you've shared just now are medicine for me on multiple levels. I think I, as a student or coachee or in that kind of relationship, really believe what you're saying and benefit from mentors and teachers who see things that way. And there are relationships that haven't been like that. And those have hurt and also, uh, yeah, that especially the empowerment work that I do is uh, related to supporting people in this way. I wouldn't call it coaching exactly, but you know, creating a container for people to flourish in their lives. And um, I think what you've shared is a really good reminder for me on that front as well, that, um, yeah, to let people unfold in their own way and at their own time and um, make their own choices. I try and aspire to show up in that role, uh, honoring the lessons that almost I wish uh, various mentor figures had had for me or something like that. But I do think there's a kind of young energy I tend to bring to that of steering maybe or <laughs> nudging. And um, I think what you're talking about is a very yin perspective, which I really value. and. Um, yeah, it's it's medicine to hear that on that level too. And that's not to say you don't encourage or support or give advice like you do, but I think mentoring feels slower and steadier and I don't know, it does, it has a different, I guess, energetic signature than maybe coaching, mm -hmm. which is you have an end point you have a goal you're achieving and not that you don't with mentoring but it's it's different it's a little more like walking with somebody mm. than pushing them to a point point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes you need that sometimes you need a coaching relationship like you are trying to learn a skill or a thing um i think there's a lot of value in that too like i've i've benefited from having coaches um and i've benefited from the being left alone with that solid presence knowing that if I fall I'm going to be caught but I also have the time and the space to figure it out on my own hmm. I'm interested on two levels hearing you say that because I know as a learner I've really benefited from seeking out coaches in the way that you're talking about when I need to uh, like to give a simple example, I worked with, I'm remembering Sasha Chapin, who I've had on my podcast. I worked with him some on some writing a couple years ago, and I specifically sought him out for that. I was like, I want to go deeper into writing mm -hmm. as a practice. And I worked with him and, um, you know, I mean, I don't think he, he was not very heavy handed as a mentor. He would sort of, uh, as a coach, I mean, but give prompts or suggestions and, um, but because I was seeking that out and that was very useful and I wanted to work with him specifically. And then, so as a learner, I'm realizing that hearing you talk it, and then I'm interested coming back to you that we're having this conversation about mentorship versus coaching in the context of your mentor, who I think it's really interesting that he sort of asked you to be mentored or something like that. Um, and I'm curious how you feel about that, what you think about that. I think that's not how I would approach it now. Um, I would never go to someone and be like, do you want me to mentor you? But at the time, it was what I needed. 
um, because I never would have, I didn't know him. I would not have asked him to do that for me. Um, and I had zero framework of like Reiki itself. So like the context, it worked hmm. um, for me at that time. That's, uh, that's, I think, intuitively exactly how I felt. I was like, wow, I don't think I would do that necessarily. I don't think I would like that. <laughs> I don't think I approve of that, actually. Um, I mean, not, not not to talk about your mentor specifically, I wasn't there, but um, but I just mean in general, having like an aesthetic, ethical preference for not that. And it's like, it seemed very clear that that's what you needed and that this blossomed in so something really beautiful for you. And, and that's part of why I want to like remove your mentor from this. I, uh, I'm just like, the, he did the thing he, you know, trusted. And it makes me want to ask, like you said to yourself, like, that's not how I would approach it now. And I wonder if you were in a situation like the one he was in, what would you do? How would you approach that situation? Well, I hope I would listen anyway, even oh. if I, I don't know. I hope I would listen. And and it maybe <laughs> it maybe wasn't as like cut and dry as I made it sound. Like we met ahead of time. We talked about what that would look like. Um, I had a lot of questions because again, I didn't know him. This strange man asked to mentor me, and I was just like, How do you Are you sure? Um so we talked about it and it was slow, like it was slow, it wasn't fast. And now I feel like the way I would if I found a person like that, or if that happened out in the world, I probably would more approach it more relationally because that's just who I am. Like in friendship, I kind of naturally do that kind of thing anyway. Um, that's probably how I would approach it now, knowing what I know, mm -hmm. but I, I, don't, I don't know. The context worked then, maybe... Who knows? Hmm. Hmm. I'm remembering your website and the way you talk about your own mentorship programs. And it seems to me that you really create an invitation for folks where you're like, hey, here's who I am and what I do. And if you want to work with me, here's what that looks like. And that's just available and you're not offering it to someone in particular. Uh, that seems very different than what unfolded for you and your mentor and seems like a really nice balance. I told you I wasn't very good at marketing. Hmm. But <laughs> I really think that like that's kind of where I've landed though. Like this is this is who I am. This is what I have to offer. If that fits where you are and what you want, then cool. Let's let's talk. Hmm. Um but that really is could be anybody there's so many different kinds of people in the world and yeah i don't know hmm. <laughs> can you share a bit about the different offerings that you have and how you work with people um well i have distance reiki sessions which you've done mm -hmm. um assume that someone doesn't know what that is i, I know a bit about it but um, well, a distance Reiki session sounds so weird when you describe it, I think. I still think it sounds kind of funny, but, um, I usually just meet with someone initially. We talk for a few minutes, we set an intention for the session, and then I have them hang up and go lay down or go move however they want to move, listen to whatever music they want to listen to, get comfortable. And then I send the Reiki and do the session. And at the end of that, we talk again over Zoom usually. And if they want to hear what I have seen or how that session went, then I will share that with them. And they also have space to talk about their experience and ask me any questions that they would want to. Um, and I am also teaching now. Um, my way which i'm i'm really proud of hmm. um you know it's taken me a really long time i still think i'm i'm a little bit of a reluctant teacher not not that i don't want to be teaching 
because I really care about people and I really, I really love being in people's lives and watching them grow and develop and create lives where they are flourishing. Um, I care about that a lot. But I had all of these opinions <laughs> about, I know I come across as very calm and quiet, but I have a lot of fire in me too. And <laughs> a lot of opinions about how things should be done, especially in like the energy work world. Not that there are, not that going and learning Reiki in a weekend is bad. It's not. That's how I did it. That clearly was what I needed and worked out well for me. But I wanted something a little bit different. I wanted something that combined that with the mentorship that I had gotten to. So I kind of created my version of that thing um, where we... We do the attunement, and then for each level, I have my students spend about three months with me, where we, where I teach, we learn about Reiki, and we swap sessions back and forth, and because everything is connected, we also talk a lot about life, and the things that are happening, and the patterns that they are noticing, and the things that are starting to creep into their awareness because they are just seeing more now than they were before. Um, and then like whatever else comes up with practicing Reiki, we do a lot of practicing because I think that's important to know, to feel comfortable practicing Reiki. Um, I didn't feel very comfortable doing that after one weekend. Like that, that took me years to feel comfortable to do in like many, many, many practice sessions to feel comfortable um, like charging for a session or wanting to have my own practice. So I, um, I have them practice a lot. I have them practice on me because it's kind of scary to practice on your own teacher. Like you, you work through, <laughs> you work through some of your fears very quickly if you have to practice on your teacher and get feedback. Um, so that's kind of what mentoring and teaching and getting attuned with me looks like. I'm having a really strong memory come up of meeting someone when I was maybe 20 and mm -hmm. her doing some, I didn't, I didn't really have very many encounters with her, but I saw her doing some Qigong and I think I was curious about it. Uh, and the people I was with were doing some Qigong with her. And I remember very strong resistance to her doing Qigong and the way she would talk about energy. She was, uh, to my memory, like very, um, like woo presenting, <laughs> we could say like, um, I think I'm pretty, it, what's the, what's that in contrast to like woo believing or something? Like I'm very woo believing at this point. Uh, don't really know how woo presenting I am. You'd have to ask someone else, but I've got increasingly woo over the years. And um, I bring this up because uh, yeah, it feels like a bit of um, a milestone for me to notice that memory and the feeling tone of that and the kinds of thoughts that I had in comparison to, you know, I think I did my first distance Reiki session with you maybe six months ago. That wasn't the first kind of thing like that that I've done in the last years. And um, on multiple levels, it just felt very clear that I would benefit from working with you, that it would be safe. That it would be useful and beneficial, which it was. Recommend people work with Trisha if they feel called to it. Um, do I fully understand what that was? No. Do I fully understand what you were doing? No. But I trust this thing we talked about intuition and like Trisha, good, Reiki, good, Trisha doing Reiki, good. Um, that's just very clear to me in the same way that like I can tell you're smiling or nodding or, you know, that it's still daylight out. It's like, those are good. Um, in my subjective reality, at least. And um, I'm sure you encounter a fair bit of people who are more like my 20-year-old self. And mm. I wonder what you would say to those folks um, about what it is that you're doing. I mean, earlier you were talking about universal life energy, but it, it, well, let's start on for, uh, just with a very simple version. 
um, and then maybe dive a little deeper, which is like, what would you say to someone about what the practice of Reiki is? Like you said, what Reiki is um, as energy, but like, what is it that you're doing when you work with someone? What is that process? Um, hang on, I cut out for a second there. Mm. Can you ask me the question again, please? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> this is so this will probably be a multi part question. So we'll just ask the simple okay. version first, which is um, earlier you described what Reiki the energy is. And we talked a little bit about what you do, uh, like how someone works with you. But I just want to backtrack a little bit about like, say someone does work with you. What is it that you're doing with them? What is what is the activity that you and they are engaging in well reiki so reiki is channeled through a practitioner into a person or a place or a thing so i'm i'm sending that energy the reiki energy to you in a session um there are different hand positions you can ask my students i don't really follow them i like to listen to the body and where i mean i generally follow that pattern most of the time, unless the person's body asks me not to. And sometimes that happens. Um, and then I just, I send the Reiki to different parts of your being. And sometimes I ask questions. Um, or if, depending on what the intention we have set ahead of time is, I will reiterate that intention or ask something about it of the person's body and there's always a response there's always a pointing to something um and then that like that space of time is just me sending the energy to different parts of the body and kind of being in communication with with that with your being with your physical body and your energy body and all of the things mm -hmm. that's really helpful um, thank you Mm -hmm. can I say one thing please of course about your mem about your memory yes and that is you should always listen to that mm -hmm. like get curious about why that's good um I don't think it matters as much that people understand what Reiki is because mm -hmm. like you said I don't think you do I don't think most people do I'm not sure I do mm -hmm. um I'm not even sure I really understand what it is, but I know what it does. I know how it makes people feel. I know how it makes me feel. I know what it's done to my life. I know, I know that it is good and it is healing. And I know that it is important. It is more important to trust your intuition about a practitioner and a modality than it is to understand what the thing is. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes those initial reactions of like, ugh, something's not right here, you should always listen. Even if it's with me, even mm -hmm. if somebody listening to this is in a session with me and they're like, nope, I think your energy is not for me, please back out. Mm -hmm. I will be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would so much rather people listen to what they need and work with someone whose energy is for them and beneficial to them then follow through an awkward experience and then deal with the repercussions of having to move yucky energy mm -hmm. it is so much easier to just walk away mm -hmm and say this isn't for me right now or that person's energy is not for me and it doesn't even mean that there's anything there might not have been anything wrong with that girl it just mm -hmm. might not have been for you at that time mm -hmm. or her energy might not have been the thing that you needed mm -hmm. that is okay and good and it's just i just think it's so important for people to listen to that mm -hmm. yeah, as you shared that i feel like i had a really distinct sense of what was going on there at the time and partly for myself it was like not having a worldview or a context where that would make sense for me as a practice and where I was ready on a personal level and, and not even just understanding but also like 
having support structures and internal skills for being able to do energy practices. Um, I was like, I'm, I'm really, this is something I've admitted to myself with these. I'm very neurotic, you know, <laughs> and I was just like full dial neurotic. Then I've like dialed it down over the years. Hopefully that continues God willing. Um, but like the dial was at full that summer and I was just like on the neuroses, um, riding that train. Um, and so like, I think uh, for myself, it wouldn't have been useful to do that at that time. And then on the other hand, I think, um, I'd be very curious actually now where she is. I, I have no way of contacting her, but, um, you know, I think she was younger than I was and she was sort of like showing people what she was doing and like, you can mimic along if you want to, but like, was not in a position to do teaching or sharing. And, uh, especially with someone like myself, who was, who it probably would have been all kinds of not fun for to, if I'd actually not trusted myself and followed. And, you know, that manifested as like cognitive thinking about, uh, this is whatever I was thinking, but, um, but I think both, you know, neither of us really were ready for that in a way. And, um, I appreciate this conversation for giving me some clarity about that. Yeah. And you did though, you listened and mm -hmm. you waited until it did feel like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, and I'm glad for myself. That's something that's gone well. And yeah, I want to circle back to, hmm, I could imagine you talking to someone, I'm imagining someone kind of specific right now. And this is again, bear with me. This is a move I do a fair bit, which you've already noticed, but it's like ask a very specific, almost playful question. That's a synonym of a different question and that I could ask in a boring way, but this is a much more interesting way to ask the question. And I think also more meaningful. I think it's like, we'll bring out more density. Um, I'm learning a lot about my process. So thanks for helping me meta narrate I'm here. Happy. Um, I'm happy to. <laughs> yes. So I'm imagining someone very specific who, who, who like you, when you connected to your intuition about Reiki at the time, actually there is a soul calling to you and to working with you and to doing Reiki. It could just as easily apply to someone else working with someone else, but I'm talking to you and um, their soul is like, I should do this. On some level, they're clear, like Reiki, Trisha, let's go. Um, and then up here in the mind, there are like thoughts about doubt and like, what is this Reiki stuff? I don't know if this is real. This is probably all bullshit. Maybe she's just lying. And then their heart knows what I know very clearly, which is like, you know, Trisha doesn't really seem like the manipulative type. She probably wouldn't be doing this to make, like there's probably better ways she could make money if she, if that was what she was optimizing for, like, this would be a really weird way to hoodwink someone. Like, I, I just like, when I look you in the eyes or read something you write, I'm just like, this is a trustworthy person, not someone who's perfect. Of course, I'm not projecting perfection onto you, but like, you know, I, I don't think you're going to hoodwink me. Um, but this person has thoughts about that. They're like, oh, is Reiki real? And I don't know. And who is this person? You know, and, but then some part of their body knows, like, I need to go in this direction. And it actually is time for them. You know, they're not um, so what would you say to such a person? Oh, well, I don't really believe in convincing someone to do something that they're not ready to do or into doing. Um, I'm not 100% sure what I would say completely, but it would probably be something along the lines of, I trust that you know yourself. And I trust that you know what you need to do. And when you are ready to make that decision, I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, wow. Probably wouldn't say much more than that. I. Wow. <laughs> That's a good answer. I, I, I really do trust that people will do the things that they want to do. Mm -hmm. I trust that we find a way to do the things that we believe we should be doing, that we want to be doing. Um and you can either decide to let your head get in the way or decide that that's not going to be an issue. And it's not my job to convince someone to get out of their head. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I will be supportive and I will have that. I will, I will talk to them and have that conversation, but um, that needs to be their choice. Hmm.
I love that answer. It's very you. It's very good. It's very true. Um, and I just want to test a little bit more, which is, uh, I'm trusting my intuition here. Okay. Uh, which is say that, you know, say they're like DMing you in Twitter or something and they're like, okay, but Trisha, I just need to know, like, what is Reiki? What are we even doing? Like, what would you say to that person again? Like to this kind of a person, you know, you've already said different things, but um, what would you say to that person? It, it really, that this is part of their process is like, they need to have a conceptual understanding in order to feel safe. It's not that they don't trust you mm -hmm. and actually they're starting to trust their intuition, but it's going to be a condition for them that they need to have some some conceptual understanding of what's happening. Hmm. I think I usually my default is to go to my experience mm -hmm. and share from okay this is where I started I jumped in knowing nothing not that I think everyone should do that um, but I jumped in knowing nothing and here is where I have ended up um, here's what Reiki has shown me along the way and I cannot guarantee that your experience that someone else's experience is going to be what mine is but the thing I know to be true about Reiki is that it is good <laughs> and it is healing and it feels like the purest form of love that I have ever experienced in my entire existence. And that's what I know. That's what... I can offer um but I don't I don't know how someone else's experience is going to unravel or what it's going to look like um maybe in 20 years I'll have you know I'll have more data <laughs> but um I know that Reiki is love and I know that it is intuitive itself and transformational and that following one step at a time is such a beautiful thing to do for the people who want that in their life and Reiki's just one path like it's just it's just it's, it's another doorway there are a lot of doorways <laughs> it doesn't have to be Reiki it can be, it could be somatic meditation. It could be, there are so many different ways to do a thing. And Reiki is just one of them. And, and I think it calls to specific people who want it to be this way or this to be a part of their way. Um, I don't know. I think, I think it's a really beautiful way to let love be the thing that guides us well you know i'm here for that uh, <laughs> um can you say more about what reiki has done for you personally like you said you would talk about that but could you be a bit more specific yeah i mean i use Re reiki and like everything now um like sometimes I Reiki the road before we go on a road trip or a Reiki can be sent forward in time and backward in time. And that's really useful. Um, now I feel like when I connect to the Reiki energy myself, I use it as a way to like ground to be back in my body. Cause like the second, the second I feel it in my palms and I'm connected to it, I am back in my body, but also with the very clear reminder that I am connected to the earth and connected to the cosmos and I'm just this piece in the middle. And that is the most sobering, grounding thought 
in the world. And I have this like very tangible reminder of that, like at my fingertips constantly. And that helps regulate my nervous system. That helps me to just focus and be more aware and conscious of what I'm doing and saying. And I, I am not perfect. I mess up, ask my kids, I mess up a lot. <laughs> But it has gifted me more awareness than I had before. And I trust that that trajectory will continue, that more things will be in my awareness over time. And the more I see, the more I can do, and the more I get to be a part of, I kind of like being an active participant in my own life and engaged with the things that are around me and Reiki is a way to do that. Have you noticed? I I also use it on my kids all the time. Hmm. (laughs) It helps them. It helps them calm down. Like it'll put the baby back to sleep at night. A lot of the time. Um, It can sometimes help my son deescalate a little bit. If he's having a meltdown, it at least helps me to deescalate myself. Hmm. I use it for pain management a ton. I have chronic fatigue, so I don't feel good a lot of the time. Um, And my husband has multiple chronic illnesses, and we use it for um, pain management for him a lot. Hmm. Hmm. I just want to say thanks again for humoring these questions, because uh, I, I don't know that this is true, but I had a distinct impression a couple of minutes ago that there is someone watching or listening to this who feels very specifically like the way I was asking questions and that their they're like body is relaxing right now. And they're like, oh, okay. I like what she said about that. And uh, so I appreciate you humoring me, if only on their behalf, even if they're imaginary. I love the people that are skeptical almost more than the people that think they know everything about it. Mm-hmm. Because the people that are skeptical and that have questions are really open because they're skeptical and they're still here and they're still asking them and they're still trying something that feels funny to them and I have a lot of respect for that Hmm. have you noticed anything about the kinds of people that tend to work with you like any trends and demographics as they would say in your old marketing job um well for for the longest time I only had people who had never had Reiki before. Hmm. Um, That has slowly shifted, but that still, I think, is maybe like 75% of my clients are people who have never had Reiki before. Um, And I like that because that means means there's something that I'm saying or something about me that people trust anyway, even not knowing and not understanding. And that's really cool and very humbling. You said for the longest time, how's that changed? Um, well, I started tweeting this year, so mm-hmm. <laughs> there are more people on Twitter who have done energy work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I I will say my practice skews more towards men than women. I think I have more male clients than female. What do you make of that? I think I am warm and feminine and good at making people feel comfortable who may not otherwise feel comfortable doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I like working with men. I think there's a lot of work to be done with men that a woman can do, that a female energy worker can do with men who want to do that kind of work. Um, and maybe that's one reason why, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should ask. Yeah, part of the reason I ask, and I think we discussed this some time ago, but my second favorite tweet that I've written at this time is love for my brothers, power for my sisters. And that's two of the areas of my life's work. And Mm -hmm. at a certain point, I started to notice that the demographics of the people that I was supporting through the love work were a lot of men, you know, roughly plus or five plus or minus five years within my age, you know, kind of roughly the same age. And, 
you know, sort of like nerdy dudes. Uh, it's like, oh, they, <laughs> anyway. Um, but I think underneath that, there's a need for this where men, part of, I, I, I know this is just how I see it stepping over into my world. Like men need to be feeling their bodies and feeling their hearts and feeling their intuitions and expressing that and acting on that. And then from there learning love and letting that shape their actions and their lives. And so I think that when I hear you talk about this, I feel a real sympathy in our work and what's being offered and uh, what's needed at this time. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think Reiki does all of those things, right? Like it, it does connect you to your body. It lets you hear your intuition and softly though, like through me, it's a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a stepping stone. Like maybe mm -hmm. that's a, a bridge to feeling safer and doing it themselves. I mm -hmm. hope, it, I hope it is that because that is, hearing you talk about that like that's something I really care about too and mm. I'm, I'm very passionate about doing can you elaborate a bit about on on what it is that you care about and why you're passionate about it I I, I mean I care about this for everyone mm -hmm. but my I have brothers and I have sons and I just have a very like masculine dominated mm -hmm. life um, and I just care so much about seeing men be able to feel the things that they are feeling safely mm -hmm. and know that the things that they're feeling in their bodies are not wrong or bad or but that they're good and that they can be expressed in a way that is healthy and serves themselves and the world around them and I think Reiki is a way to do that I'm very sympathetic to that and really glad to hear how you perceive that and relate to it and again feel sort of a sympathy in that and it makes me want to ask about this second part of the clause of the tweet that I wrote you know love for my brothers power for my sisters and of course that means that um, this is this is the love tattoo, and then this is the empowerment tattoo. It's a wand. And um, for me, both of these, of course, are offered to everyone in the same way that you offer Reiki to everyone. But I really see a, a, a corresponding need for what I have to offer with empowerment to women, in particular, power for my sisters. And um, I guess it makes me want to ask... Um, this question. I see women facing different obstacles with sharing themselves with the world that I don't see men experiencing. You know, for example, um, if I ask a woman to come on my podcast, there's a much higher rejection rate than with men. Um, men typically say yes to coming on a podcast. Um, or, um, you know, uh, I often suggest to people, for example, that they write a blog post about something that they've shared with me. And men will be like, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll get on that. And women will be like, oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe later, maybe not. Um, you know, this is a rough characterization of I'm generalizing, but um, I see underneath this, this is just, again, my subjective sense-making of this sort of thing, but um, this pattern, I mean, feminists would call it the patriarchy where men are not blocked in a way that women are blocked. And um, there's a whole host of resistances I see women undergoing about sharing their gifts with the world and putting themselves out there and offering what they have to be of benefit in a way that's like legible or public or actually helps them to receive what they need or that kind of thing. And I see you as someone who's not I mean, you know, I don't know what your experience of this is, this is kind of what's asking, like, what is your experience of this? But I, I see you from the outside as someone who's not immune to this, but who's worked through some of that. You are sharing yourself with the world. You know what you're doing at this time. 
uh, and how you want to offer yourself to the world. And you are putting yourself out there. You are on Twitter and Instagram and all these places sharing what you're doing and saying, hey, here's who I am. Here's how I can help if you want that. Great. And I'm curious about your reflections about what it's taken for you to get to that point. Hmm. A lot of doing the wrong thing. Um, a lot of, you know, I have one of my favorite tweets is that phrase, the knowing comes with the doing. And I say that because I've done a whole lot of the wrong thing. <laughs> and in that, I've learned the things that are for me. And in doing the wrong things and trying things in different ways, um, I've even, I mean, I've tried doing different things with my business. If you look through like my Instagram, you'll see it shift. You'll see how I talk about Reiki shifting over the last couple of years because I just tried. I didn't care as much as if it, if it were wrong or if I decided to say it differently in a year because I have, but I started. Like I started just trying things to see what fit. And I let go of being attached to the thing that I was trying being the right way and just let it inform me of what it was. Like, does this feel like the right way to say it? Do I think I want to say it differently? Do I think I want to do this differently? The way I practice now is different than when I started, but I started and I started practicing and when I feel like something needs to shift, I let it, I change it. I am not attached to my structure. I'm not attached to it being a specific way. Um, in fact, I really hope it keeps changing. I kind of want to see those things evolve. Um, but that, that, that confidence or that like putting myself out there, I just did it. I did it wrong. I let go of it being perfect. I knew it wasn't going to be. And I just tried, I just started trying things and gave myself grace when I was really embarrassed by them. <laughs> Cause there are definitely things I have said in the past two years that I think are very cringe now. And that's great. Cause that means I'm not there anymore and I'm here. Um, so yeah, I don't, I just, I just started putting myself out there. Like you just, you can't, you can't get where you want to be if you never start. Like, I know that that is such a cliche thing, but it is so true. Like, you just, you have to start doing things. And so I just started doing it and gave myself grace when it wasn't how I wanted it to be and let it evolve. I expect, I, I all of the things that I put out there, I had a mentor who said that everything she put out there was just a timestamp. And she trusted that it was going to transform and it was going to change. And I've kind of internalized that. I just trust that this is a timestamp. It's going to change. It's going to look different in a year. That's wonderful. But I'm not going to get to it being different in a year if I don't do something right now. Mm -hmm. uh, my process. I think it speaks really highly to the training that you've done and to Reiki that at least over here, my estimation is that that probably helped you quite a bit to show up to your life's work. Uh, that's that's something I'm hearing, even if you're not saying that. I don't know, maybe you feel free to disagree, but that's what I'm taking away in part as well. That um, I mean, I, I love what you said about just trying things and starting and seeing it as a timestamp and all that. I think that's extremely practical. And I'm just like, oh, it also speaks really highly to the inner work that you've done and the modalities that you've explored that... Um, uh, yeah, that you're doing this. I, um, yeah, and I, and I do think being like connected to like, I mean, I've had a lot of different careers. I wouldn't have said I felt connected to my purpose and the other ones. Mm -hmm. I do feel that now. I don't feel that just about Reiki. Like I'm a mother. That's also my purpose. My family is also my purpose. The things we are building and creating and that I'm doing with my boys that's also part of my purpose, but Reiki also feels very much like I am connected to my life's purpose. Hmm. Like it's just very quiet, very clear. It just is. Um, and that helps because no matter how many things I try or how many things I shift, I still know it's in the direction of 
my purpose here on earth and the things that I am doing are part of that. Hmm. And that, that helps. And yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of practice and a lot of boring slog in those years too, where I just did Reiki over and over and over and over and over and honed my craft, which I am still doing, but, um, confidence isn't really like a decision. It's sort of like a thing you, I mean, I can't, you can decide to just go do it. That doesn't mean you're going to feel confident about doing it. Um, but the confidence comes with the practice and the doing it over and over and over again, the, the devotion to the thing. You know, I brought a pretty strong frame from my own experience to this question. I'm like, here's what it's been like for me. And how, how, how are you, Trisha? <laughs> um, <laughs> And I want to hear, like, sort of step back a little bit and just hear what, if anything, is your own sense of what it's like to be a woman putting herself out there in the world. And uh, if any of the patterns I'd noticed that I'd share resonate for you or totally don't resonate for you, or if you see it differently, I want to hear your perspective on it. I think think I did actually have a thought when you were sharing what you've noticed about men and women generally and I have noticed that men actually even though they have different things that they're handling or working through or dealing with they do seem to be the ones who are more willing to commit to like long-term working on something on Reiki you don't see that as much with women not that that doesn't happen, it does, like it does, but um, I think generally speaking, there have been more men who have wanted to do like multiple sessions versus women will try once and then check and then be like, oh, I'm good. Or I've got, and maybe they are, like maybe that they figured the thing out with the one session and maybe the men have more reconnecting to themselves to do. I don't, I don't know, but um, my students are women. Um, I have yet to have a male student. Um, which makes me, as you were talking, it just sort of made me think of that, like, empowerment for women to be confident, because they have the space to work through some of those things that I worked through, and they have the, um, my experience, and just the space to start working through some of those things, which they get to do in, in training. And learning how to do Reiki. So I don't know. Hmm. I think I see similar patterns, but like um like a different, it's a different angle. So to to be clear, just to reflect what I'm hearing, a lot of the clients you work with are men, not all exclusively, but especially recurring clients tend to be men. And then when you're working as a mentor with students of Reiki, those have been exclusively women up to this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and and stepping outside of the context of Reiki, just as a person alive on this planet, have you noticed anything similar to these trends? Yeah, I guess either about men or women. Like, what sense do you make of the moment of our culture with these issues? <laughs> oh, yeah. Easy questions. Today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm really chat. What's the universe? What's our culture like? No, but what's what's it's to be clear again. This is a your perspective experience question, which you can't get wrong. You can't get wrong. I do think, hmm, what do I think? I think sometimes it's hard to be a human on this planet. <laughs> I think right now men have it really hard. I think we kind of expect them to do a lot of things without having the um, social infrastructure for those things to even be possible. And I have a lot of sympathy for that. I think in a very different way, we do the same thing for women. Um, I've experienced this more as being a mother. Um, like I'm supposed to do it all? What the hell? No. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm one human being, but our culture expects me to like, 
have a job and care for my children and care for my family and my home all by myself, which is ridiculous. Like other, when I lived in Mexico, everybody had a maid and a nanny and, um, actually women in Mexico were lawyers and doctors before women in the States ever were because they accepted help. Mm. We don't, we, we don't do that. Mm. Like We frown on the women who do that. Um, we think less of them and that's just insane. Right. Hmm. Um, and I admit I have taken a lot on the state, but I, I I like it that way. Like that's my choice. <laughs> and I like when I'm looking at like my own priorities, like I let them shift. I work less when I need to work less, and my family needs me more. Like I'm I'm at peace with that being a thing right now. Um, but I see a lot of my friends who are mothers really struggling with that. Like, do I stay home? Do I work? Do I somehow try to do both? Um, it seems to be really hard to to do it right in any way. Mm. Um, yeah. And we we do, we ask, we ask men to be to be sensitive and to be kind. And then mock them for not being masculine. And I just I just think that's ridiculous. Like, especially um, especially now as an energy worker, realizing that like we are all masculine and feminine energy in one body. And I just see that so differently now. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I'm just going to thank you again for humoring my difficult, unexpected questions. Uh, I have a, I actually have a tweet about this. Uh, I forget how I put it, but like, there's a way in which if someone asks you a question, you have an answer to it. Uh, and like, I'm asking you questions. So I'm like, no, I, I feel you have an answer to this. Like, is it the answer? Is it the complete answer? Is it the right answer? Does it encounter the, you know, encompass the whole totality of the universe? No, but like, I would like to hear your perspective on this. So I thank you for humoring me and sharing it. Of course. Mm. So um, there's a few tweets that I've picked out that I would love to ask you about. Um, I'll read them to you first and then ask my question. Uh, this is from August of this year. You said, oh, my advice as a Reiki practitioner and mentor, go stick your feet on the earth and feel how far down you can feel. Do it again and again and again. We don't talk about higher planes here until you can feel the earth pulsing beneath your feet and the utter aliveness of your body. So my question is, how do you understand grounding and why is it so important? Oh, I think my internet froze again. I'm so uh, sorry. That's okay. Um, did you hear the tweet? I did. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know a tweet. What was your okay. question? My question is, how do you understand grounding and why is it so important? Um, I was being snarky in that tweet. Um, oh, okay. A little bit snarky, but it's very true. I hmm. still think grounding is the thing we miss the most. That is maybe the most foundational element to a spiritual or a somatic practice. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. Every house had lightning rods on the roof because we had thunderstorms all the time and had old farmhouses that would burn up if they got hit by lightning. So every house had a lightning rod, which is just like this metal rod that connects all the way down to the ground. So if your house gets hit by lightning, it catches the lightning shoots down that metal rod and into the earth and your house is safe think of grounding as the same way life throws a whole lot of things at us a whole lot of energy from other people um that we sometimes hold on to sometimes get stuck if from my perspective even during a session people's bodies are releasing things that they've been holding on to all the time i don't want to be holding on to that it's not mine um, and that's true for a lot of the things that we encounter 
around us in our environment from other people someone else's anger can just get thrown at you and if you're not grounded it stays and you carry it on and so I like to think of grounding as being so centered so rooted so flexible that whatever comes our way it just hits you it moves through you into the earth and it's gone you know what's there you know that the storm happened but it didn't change a thing and I think the best way to practice this is quite literally putting your feet on the ground again and again and again until you can feel the buzz of the earth in your feet until you know what it feels like for your body to be physically grounded so that when you're out in a situation you can just notice the thing happening let it pass through you and move on um when i first started doing reiki i did not take this seriously because i did not understand what that meant um i was like cool i'm grounded i got it i did a visualization i'm i'm okay and then i did a session on my brother my brother is the other half of my soul on this earth he is that i am closest to and most most alike and most different from the entire planet um he was going through some really heavy things at the time and being a blood relative it also strengthened it strengthens the energetic connection between us it's just strong i took on everything of his in that session it took me three days three days to be okay again after that session and then I was like "Mm, there's something to this idea of grounding (laughs) I think this might actually be important like my mentor wasn't just talking when he said that he he meant it (laughs) um but I had to experience what it felt I'm glad it happened I had to experience what it felt like to not be grounded to be so thrown off that it took days for me to come back to myself and back to center um I think being grounded is really important like you need to be you need to know where where you're rooted where that spot in your body you can go and be in your body and be centered and let let yourself roll with the waves that are coming at you do you think it took him it it did yes do you think it took him three (laughs) days to recover from that interaction yeah. So uh, what do you think his experience was like? Oh, his experience was really powerful. Um, I think his experience was really powerful, but because it was me doing Reiki on him, he felt better. I didn't. I felt worse. Um, that has never happened. That hasn't happened to me since in a session. Like I took grounding pretty seriously after that. But um, Re- like Reiki being only being a healing energy like it it in and of itself can't do harm it can really only do good like he felt better he felt lighter he had released a lot of those things um and i had them are there any times where a practitioner might be unskillful and you might walk away from a Reiki session being like, oh, that not like your brother did, where it's like, oh, that wasn't, that did not feel so good or something like that. Yes. So while Reiki itself is only good and can only heal, the vessel matters because the practitioner is still channeling the energy through their body. So like, you know, when you drink out of a metal cup, you can taste the metal. It's kind of the same with Reiki, I think the practitioner matters a great deal. Even though the energy itself is good, you still there's still a feedback loop between the two of you. You're still going to be interacting with their energy. So you their energy needs to be clean. It needs to be safe. You need to feel safe with that. And their energy needs to be clean going into that session. What helps you to be a good vessel for this energy? Well, 
this is kind of my whole life now. Like I take it very seriously. I have like a set of practices I do before I go into a session um, to ensure that my energy is clean then. But I also think living a life of integrity and practicing Reiki myself every day is is a big part of that too. It's not just like a thing I only do in sessions. It's It's literally woven into my entire life. Uh, this is a two-part question. The first one is, have you ever had a session in your entire time of learning Reiki and practicing it and sharing it with folks where you walked away feeling like you hadn't been a pure, clean vessel for the person you were working with? No, because I have, I have like a set of rules. If I'm not, um, if I feel like I can't, set aside whatever I had beforehand, um, I won't do it. I would reschedule. Um, Reiki still is good and still works, even if I'm not, I don't have to be 100% going into every session. That's just not humanly possible to be perfect every single time. Um, but like the one rule that I think is the most important is to never do Reiki angry. Like if I have anger, I cannot set aside. I do not practice. Um, what? And that, and then I do have, I do have like, I have safeguards in place, it's like things that I would do to ensure I didn't pass my things to them. Why anger in particular, and not like sadness or fear or something like that? That's what I was taught. Hmm. Um, There's something about the energy of anger that just feels really contrary to what Reiki is in principle. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't, it just, I don't know, it feels wrong because it feels wrong. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Um, what are the safeguards you have in place? Um, I do, I clear my room. Like I energetically clear and seal my room. I ground myself before going into a session. I do different like visualizations or different rituals to ensure that my energy is clean going into that session and after too, because I don't want to be holding on to anything or be carrying anything that is not my own. Mm -hmm. like the before and the after matter a lot, a lot too mm. and I've practiced I have at this point I have years of having practiced doing this and now I am skilled at knowing when something is not my own and letting go of it mm. As someone who both has worked with you and who's, you know, implicitly recommending you by having you in this conversation or, uh, you know, ever interacting with you on Twitter, I'm grateful for the high degree of integrity that you have with these practices. And I have one last question about this particular thing, which is um, if you imagine that you broke your rules, uh, and went into a session angry or not grounded. Um, we can just assume that would not be so great for the person you're working with. That's fine. <laughs> what do you imagine that would be like for you? I mean, grounding. Hmm. Grounding is also a constant thing. So it's something that like, you're not, not just grounding once and done. Like you, it, I'm constantly coming back to that or bringing myself back to that. So being ungrounded is not necessarily a problem because I can come back to being grounded. Um, going in angry and choosing to be angry throughout the session, I think that actually would be a problem. Um, I imagine that that would feel awful because it's breaking my own, it's breaking my word with myself like my contract with me um, and to my clients, that would probably feel terrible. Um, I have kind of a funny story 
about why this matters to me so much. I, um, when I first started practicing, I made a commitment to practice on my husband weekly. Um, he's really good at picking fights before those sessions, like something, something would go wrong and we would get into an argument or, um, I'd be mad at him about something or something. There would be, there would be some tension somewhere. So I made the commitment to practice on him weekly and he would, there would always be tension before we went into that session, like almost unfailingly in that entire year. And I'm really stubborn. I really wanted to practice. So I just got really good at resolving that tension or setting it aside so that I was no longer angry in this moment, even if it was something that needed to be revisited later, I would just not be angry anymore. I would be able to practice. So I've had a lot of training in how to do that. Mm -hmm. There was a whole year of me practicing that with somebody that can make me really upset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my clients don't make me that angry. That just doesn't happen. It's not the same. So I've practiced that for a long time, setting it aside if I have to, or just letting it go because I can. Um, when I heard you answer this, you're saying it feel really bad because you're breaking your own integrity and your own code of conduct. And that would feel bad for you and for your clients. There's this kind of like moral feeling of bad. Um, I imagine that it would also feel like somatically bad, mm -hmm. not just emotionally, which is in the body, of course, but like that there would be like energy blockages or something like that. If you were feeling angry during the session, I'm curious what that, what you imagine, because this hasn't happened, what you imagine that might feel like qualitatively. If so, I mean, I could just be totally off base, but for some reason, I'm curious about this. So that's one of my rules with myself is always ask the question I'm curious about. It's also possible, and I think this is probably more likely that this is what would happen. The Reiki would clear it. Mm. Because even in me sending Reiki to someone else, it's still going through me. Like, I am still, I am, I'm connected to that Reiki. It's more likely that the Reiki would clear the anger anyway, <laughs> which is probably why, one reason why I think that's never happened. Hmm. Wow. Well, thank you again. It's like, you're really humoring me today, Trisha. Thank you. Uh, um, I love, I love, oh, good. I'm glad. I, I'm, it's funny because there's a symmetry again here where like you have this rules, these rules with yourself about how to show up to your sessions. And I have my rules about how I show up to these sessions, which is if I have a question, even a really weird one, or like it's complicated, like I'm going to ask it, you know, and I don't even know why, but here we go. So I thank you for humoring them. Yes. Of course. Of course. I would actually be more worried about not being grounded in mm. a session because I feel a lot of what that client is feeling in my mm -hmm. body um if they're uncomfortable if they're sad if they're carrying grief or pain um that passes through me like a lot of the times if they're releasing something big that manifests as physical pain in my body mm. or i will start crying because i can feel the grief that they are feeling i would be far more concerned about carrying that with me if i were not grounded and not being able to be like, ha, ah, this is not my own. It can go. Just to take a step back, I we started this investigation with me reading this tweet to you. And you said, oh, well, you're being a little snarky. And um, I sometimes don't know when people are being snarky, certainly in text-based communications like Twitter. And I wonder if you could explain to me what the little bit of snarkiness there is. I think sometimes sometimes in a healing or spiritual community we get really excited about third eye activation mm -hmm. and meditations that connect us to these incredible things in the cosmos which 
I think are wonderful and good <laughs> and we should do too, but I think we're capping our ability to do that if we're not grounded in our own bodies first. Mm -hmm. And I get a little bit frustrated with the people that only focus on those things because there's so much more to the picture. It's, it's so much bigger than just that. And <laughs> I think feeling the earth pulsing beneath our feet, the aliveness of our bodies actually allows us to do those things better and mm -hmm. more fully than if we were only going after those things. And sometimes I see people skipping that step or not even acknowledging that it's there. And I find that a little bit frustrating and being a little bit snarky of, hmm. about it. And again, this is a kind of medicine for me to hear because, you know, I haven't had a lot of like flashy stuff in my own spiritual practice, but like I can be really adamant about, I'm going to ask you literally every question or trust literally every idea I have or write literally every thought I have down or a handful of other things that I'm very insistent on that look very mundane, but come from what I've explored of these practices. Um, and I hear a resonance in that of just feeling your body, just being grounded, just being aware of this energy flow is already highly complex, beautiful, resonant, uh, meaningful. And that's like the way forward. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I agree. Like, I, mm. think, I think there's so much right here. There's so much right here. Like, not that I don't want to do those other things too. Like, of course I do. They're beautiful. Like, it's good that we get to be connected to those things and explore them too. And also, there's so much just right here hmm. now. And I think that's important too. Hmm. It reminds me one of the yeah, one of the tweets I want to ask you about is you said, "I firmly believe that life is the spiritual practice." How did you come to have that belief? And realizing I didn't have another option, <laughs> that I could decide that this was my spiritual practice and live accordingly, or just do nothing, and that's not really an option for me at all i think it happened after maybe after i had my boys somewhere in there where it's just like all of these things that i am doing day in and day out they matter they're a practice they're sacred these things that i'm doing are sacred and they're really boring and they're really boring. I hate folding the laundry. I just, I don't like it. And it's still a really sacred thing. And there's still wonder in it. And it just, our whole lives get to be our spiritual practice. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be these fancy things. It doesn't have to be these things that we can't reach or that are just out of our grasp. It's literally all right here in front of me. It's in everything that I am doing. It's in everything that I am saying. It's my whole life. I feel grateful that you're living the life that you're living and also like permissioned even more fully to live the life that I'm living. And yeah, hearing myself say that, I hope that anyone else who's listening feels that as well. Like, mm. I hope so, because we are all given our own life to live. If that's the one we've got. And even if there are things that we want to change, even if there are things that we're moving towards or we want to do differently, like today matters, right now matters. Doing the tasks that I've been given to do today are still part of that mm. and they're still good and viewing those things as being good and sacred and part of the 
whole of it makes it a little bit easier to fold the laundry sometimes. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Another question from the tweets. Uh, this is something you said a couple months ago. Learning to be in discomfort safely, comfortably is one of the kindest gifts you can give yourself. It won't make the discomfort less or make it go away, but it will give you solidness and hope within it. The ability to bring yourself back to center when you fall off. How did you learn to be dis with, with discomfort? And yeah, I ask that so that it might be useful to someone else. So what what advice would you give to someone who wants to learn that? I'm going to point back to the story of me stopping drinking earlier mm -hmm. and choosing, like choosing to stop numbing and choosing to actually see what was in my life that was making me uncomfortable and just feeling those feelings. And not that it needs to be that, <laughs> that drastic for people learning how to do that. I think you can microdose discomfort in a lot of ways. Um, just doing things that feel slightly outside of our comfort zone and then pushing that boundary out just a little bit and then trying something that's just a little bit beyond that next time that makes you slightly uncomfortable is a perfectly valid way of doing that. But really allow to feel the thing for as long as <laughs> sitting with those feelings over time, a comfortableness with being uncomfortable. And a whole lot of life, in my experience, is pretty uncomfortable. And it's less limiting to me to be able to still live within that discomfort, to still be able to make decisions, to still be able to feel safe in my body, to notice when I'm not feeling safe to notice when it's really uncomfortable and I need to do something else for a little while. And I feel like I've got mm, a lot of freedom from being okay with being uncomfortable. You're breaking up for just a little bit of that. And I just want to check what I heard. I heard you say something like, or in, kind of inferred you were saying you might just sit with it for 10 minutes and that would, but over time kind of build up your capacity for it. Were you saying something like that? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think you can kind of like microdose discomfort mm -hmm. and just feel it for a little while. It doesn't have to be a permanent feeling. Like sometimes that doesn't feel safe. Like starting out that often doesn't and feeling it for just a little while and then doing something else. And then next time you notice that uncomfortable feeling stretching it out for another 30 seconds and feeling it a little bit more until finally over and over and again, they start feeling a little less uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you start noticing that you are safe and feeling uncomfortable. I'm amused at the synchronicity of you dropping out a little bit during talking about this because as well, I, I experienced some discomfort in my body when that kind of thing happens. And then I imagine it's uncomfortable for someone listening because I, I don't edit this that much. I'm not going to edit that out. And they're like, well, oh, you know, oh no, uh, uh, like it's breaking up. And um, maybe someone is uncomfortable listening and someone gets like, I don't know, 30 seconds of practicing that. I think that's kind of funny. Great. It's a good opportunity to practice it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Here's another question from the tweets. You said, I think shame needs a witness to move, specifically another person hearing your shame with compassion. There's something about the energy of shame that needs to be seen out and open to yeah. metabolize. How did you learn that? By doing it. Hmm. I don't know how else to learn things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have I a story about it? That... Um... Yes. I'm not going to give you all the details, sure. but there was a thing I was feeling a whole lot of shame about, really embarrassed about it. Just like, I just had really messed up 
my whole life actually because of this one thing. And I shared it with a friend. And then they shared that the same thing had happened to them in their hmm. life, that they had done something very similar. And it had not, in fact, ruined their entire life. It did change how they did some things, which was true for me too. But it didn't ruin their life. They were okay. Then I realized it made it feel more livable for me. The shame was more livable because I knew someone else had experienced it. Not just that they'd experienced it, but that they'd witnessed me in it. And they didn't think less of me for having done the thing. They just sort of held the space for me. They're like, yeah, I get it. I've been there. And the shame just sort of dissolved. And I think that's the thing about shame. Like it festers. We make it bigger in secret because we're hiding it or because we make it think, at least I make myself think that it's like the thing that's going to ruin everything because I'm a terrible person. And then you let someone witness that shame, someone loving and with compassion and solidness. And you realize that the thing is not, in fact, but it's just a thing. That feels really powerful to me, like a really powerful way to move through shame and allowing someone else to witness you in it. There seems to be this like social or communal aspect of shame that it just needs other people to see it, to witness it, for it to be moved through. I really resonated with that. And it was so helpful to me to hear that tweet and to hear you talk about it now and made sense of different things that have happened in my life. And when I feel relief and peace from things that are plaguing me, it's um, like, oh yeah, that's that's what's going on. So um, mm -hmm. I want to ask, you know, we've covered a lot of different topics and gone into quite a bit of depth about your work and your life. And I want to ask how you see yourself from this conversation. Is there anything that you've learned about yourself or how do you see yourself? If you listen to the things that you've found yourself saying in response to these questions, what do you understand about yourself or what do you notice? Well, I think I'll be honest. I told you going into this, I was feeling some anxiety that I'm not a good, I feel like I'm not a good speaker. Like I'm not well-practiced at that. And I talked to little kids most of the day. Like I don't. <laughs> and I feel like I did okay. I feel like I said the things that I wanted to say and I said them well. So I'm proud. I'm proud that I didn't let fear get in the way of talking about things that really matter a lot to me and sharing that with you is just such an honor and a delight and so much fun to do and yeah like thinking back on our conversation I'm just I love getting to talk about the things that I love and that matter to me and I can do that <laughs> beautiful is there anything else that you'd like to talk more about or yeah, have a conversation about? I did have one question I wanted to ask you that mm. doesn't have any anything to do with anything we've talked about. Great. I'm curious about. Can I ask you? Of course. Okay. I've noticed sometimes in conversation, this is something I really love about you. When you have a thought, you just laugh out loud. Mm. And I love that. I really admire that. I'm wondering what things about yourself make you laugh out loud? Like what Ooh. things do you find so delightful that you just laugh out loud? Mm. Mm, what a lovely question and reflection. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel like it's important to give a little context for this before I answer, and I feel like that will also let me answer fully. Um, at a certain point, I decided slash realized slash um, 
almost like the word that's coming to mind is like committed, like made a vow with the universe or something to see it in a certain way and to relate to it in a certain way, which is that there's only three need, three or arguably four things I need to do. And that that's a life is made of days. So that means I have to do this today. Like it matters that I do this today. And if I do this today and every day of my life, I'm living a good and beautiful life by my own standards. Maybe that's a way to talk about it, which is like giving myself almost, this is a kind of crude metaphor, but almost like a report card to judge my own life by. And it's like, there's three things to do, which is to enjoy my life, to learn and grow, and then to serve others. And implicit in all of that is not harming other people. I mean, of course we make mistakes and and do have impacts on people that are negative, but to aspire to reduce harm, to not harm people, to not intentionally harm people. Um, if I'm doing those things, then I am living a good life by my own standards. And um, part of that is enjoyment. It starts with enjoyment. It's just like, it's a, it feels almost like a moral duty to enjoy my life. Uh, like to myself, like I don't want to live a life I'm not enjoying. And then also to the universe, like I feel like I've been given this gift of being alive and it would be rude to not enjoy it, not do my best to enjoy it. That is, um, of course, there's difficulties and challenges. I know all about that. I'm not saying, you know, there's no negativity or something. Um, there isn't challenge, but like to do my best to really enjoy every day and to notice the things that I enjoy and relish them. And uh, laughter is one of those things. It's just, it's, it's joy in the here and now. And if I'm laughing, like I'm already doing it. It's like, I'm already enjoying my life right then. It doesn't go somewhere. It's not, it doesn't, this is why a report card is a crude metaphor because it doesn't get me anywhere. It's not adding up to something. It's just in itself already enjoyment. And I'm already living a good life if I'm laughing. And um, really knowing that on a deep level makes it important for me to practice laughing. And at a certain point, I realized that the same kinds of really spiritual technologies that I use with love encompass laughter and joy and humor. Because to zoom out, you're like, hey, there's this positive quality that's a thought or a feeling that I can intentionally cultivate and have more of. And that fits laughter, not just love or happiness or joy, but also amusement or that kind of thing. Um, and so I started to use those strategies mm -hmm. with laughter and try to intentionally laugh more and more. So at this point, it, you know, I think this is part of why I wanted to give some context is I'll have to, I think I'll have to get back to you about what about myself makes me laugh, but it feels so somatic. It feels so physical where like I, in the same way they would breathe, that's physical. Um, you can be mindful of it and have a relationship with it, but it's so physical. Like I just start laughing. I just laugh and it's funny and I'm happy and I'm joyful and uh, I'm winning at my own life in that moment. And uh, like, yeah, I don't know. I guess I laugh at my own jokes or um, my, I do silly voices and expressions and acting more and more, that kind of thing. Um but it's really just at root a somatic embodied thing where it's like a response that I let myself indulge in. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I love that. I'm mm. glad I asked that question. That was such a good answer. Mm. Actually, that that like resonates with me in a couple of different ways. I love that. Hmm. Mm. I like making silly voices too. Mm. I do that all the time. Mm. <laughs> it's just fun. And I like what you said about like living a good life by your own standards. That's something I actually, I realized about myself recently. I, <laughs> I took this personality test and it said I wasn't ambitious at all. And I was just like, that feels wrong. I have a lot of ambitions. And then I realized I'm not ambitious compared to anything else or anyone else or like cultural standards, but compared to myself, I am because it's, it's my standards that I care about, not anyone else's. And I love, I love that. I love that you're doing that to your own standard. That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. What is your quality of ambition or your standard of it? My, ask me again. 
Yeah, you shared that like you have your own way of relating to ambition. Like, what is that? Like I set, I set my own. I care about my own outcomes. Really, like to someone else or something. Like I will do a thing because I want to do the thing because I care about the thing because it matters to me, not because somebody said I should go do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, or because people, <laughs> or because someone said, this is the thing you should have by the time you're 37. I do not care. I care what I think about accomplishing the things that I want to accomplish, but I don't think about them as much in relation to what other people are accomplishing according to someone else's standard or the way that they think you should have things by the time you should have them or it just has never crossed my mind I guess mm. I just do them because I want to mm. because I like to <laughs> because it mattered to me uh, uh. <laughs> yeah an interesting way I feel like that has a key to the puzzle of the ambition that I see in you and this power that I see in you that we were talking about you know, difficulties for women. And it's like, yeah, go seek power, but on your own terms, go, go be ambitious, but on your own terms, because you want to, in the ways that you want to not because someone else is telling you to, or because you think you should or something like that, like, find that within yourself. It feels really empty when you do it the other way. Mm -hmm. If it's not you, if it's not what you want, like mm -hmm. one way or another, you feel that in your body, one way or another, that gets conveyed subconsciously or in your energy or how you do the thing like if it is if it is not the way you want it at least this has been true for me if it is not the thing that i want it does not come out the way that i want because i didn't want it mm -hmm. and it didn't matter to me and even if i am objectively have those skills or i'm capable of doing that thing it just isn't right. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. It doesn't turn out right because it wasn't the thing that was true to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for knowing that about yourself and for sharing it with us. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for indulging my question. Oh, of course. It's a treat. You know, I like <laughs> questions. So, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me and for really sharing your heart. It's, as I said at the very beginning, you have a sweet heart and mm -hmm. uh, it feels warm to speak with you. And I feel like I've learned a lot and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm like proud to know you. I think you're a lovely person who's a gift to this world and a gift in my life. And I feel proud of sharing this conversation with people. I'm excited to share it. I'm like, it's good that people know that Trisha exists and who she is. So thank you for being you. Thank you for being you. My goodness. What would we do without you? Uh, uh, too kind, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you.